Afternoon. We going to um, I'm very pleased mm -hmm. to see that we okay. got a nice sized crowd for our next presenters. This is a very popular topic, very obviously. I've been chatting with a few of the festival goers and uh, there's been a lot of talk about this presentation. And you're all here to see it live and in person. But before we get into that, we've got a couple of uh, show related announcements to make. The first thing that I wanted to mention is that festival merchandise, as you probably already know because people have been rocking it all up and down Queens Park that this merchandise is available. We got t-shirts, buttons, book bags, all of these things are for sale. I'll tell you all the dirty details on travel writing from four young writers who intimately know the highs and lows of this profession. The first one is Sarah Cation, who worked at a newspaper in Bangkok and a school in Seoul before joining Outpost. Laura Godfrey is a graduate of York University. She's currently studying journalism at Centennial College. And Andrea Grant is Outpost's associate editor. She has traveled to over 30 countries. And Ryan Murdoch is a consummate travel writer who is obsessed with deserts, nomadic peoples, and marginal regions where cultures meet. I got a little similar thing, but you add an S, I'm obsessed with dessert. That's just me. Ladies and gentlemen, say hello to everybody from Outpost Magazine. Here they come. It looks like a rock star with sunglasses. Yeah. yeah. into the, this field, but most, if, if you pick up any, any book on travel writing, they'll tell you, uh, start local, find something interesting in your hometown or your home area and try to write about that, and I completely disagree with that. I would rather eat nails and, and try to find something interesting in my hometown, quite a small place, a couple thousand people, uh, it doesn't do anything for me, I mean, I, I, I think the reason you can't do that is because you can't manufacture a story. Like, you can... You can, for the kind of stuff that's like in the newspaper travel section, you can do that. I'm not talking about that. But often when I read that stuff, I think those people didn't go anywhere. You could just research this online. It's not, uh, they didn't bring anything personal to it. They didn't have any interesting experience there. But I'm talking about travel literature, which is quite a separate thing. If you're, I think you're much better off to just take a shit job for, for a year if you have to and save a pile of money and go to a place that resonates with you. Because the, uh, the writer Lawrence Thurl said that uh, everybody has a place that kind of resonates with them, a, a landscape, or a culture, or uh, an environment, and that's where you do your most productive work. So I think you're much better off saving a pile of money and going to that place, having a meaningful experience that changes you, and bringing that back and writing about it, because that'll, that'll speak to people. But that's, that's much better than just trying to come up with gimmicky ideas. I mean, everybody does that, and you don't stand out at all. I think it's also a myth that you should um, that you have to start small. Uh, I don't think that's true as well because, as as uh, Andrew and Sarah are both saying, you can position yourself in an in interesting place and leverage that. Um, like when they say start small, they submit to your local newspaper, submit to all these these tiny sources, write the stuff at the front of the magazine, you know, that doesn't get your name on it, and, and build your credit slowly. Uh, when I started out, I was living in uh, in Tokyo, 
and I, ma I managed to uh, get into North Korea. On, I, I, I found this guy in Beijing who scammed me a visa, and it's, I paid a lot of money. It's a long story, but but I knew that not many people had been in there, so I could leverage that into a newspaper column right away. And I know a, a column is several steps up from from just submitting random articles. So that pulled more weight. Uh, I got myself into a couple of anthologies after that, this uh, Traveler's Tales series in the U.S. And from there, I submitted a story to Outpost as a main feature, not uh, not front of the book stuff. Uh, the, it was rejected. I got a nice letter, maybe six months later. Heard nothing for quite a while, and then and then I got another phone call. Uh, several months after that, I guess it was, uh, they changed editors, found this piece still sitting there, and wanted to run it as a main feature in that issue. And, and it was later nominated for the National Magazine Awards. So it's totally subjective. Uh, your, your work might resonate with one editor and not another. So. You you should uh, you should submit widely, but submit someplace where it's it's more likely to go over. But also don't don't think you need to start at the bottom and work your way up. I mean everybody does that, and, and you can circumvent that by, by smart positioning. Is the highest possible quality that you can. And not just in terms of formatting and knowing the the proper the accepted way to submit stuff. Because uh, there, there's an accepted way to, to format the, the page and format the article, and if it comes in not adhering to that, it, it often gets chucked right in the garbage because it's, it's assumed that you don't know your craft. But not just that, but also uh, knowing your craft. What, what I mean by that is um, if, you, if you wanted to do serious travel literature, you should read everything in the genre. You should read uh, all the top names. You won't resonate with all of them, but the ones that you do, you should pick them apart. Uh, look at what's original. If, if you've read, I mean, I've read everything from like old explorers' journals on on up, and to somebody like Paul Theroux, who uh, introduced dialogue to to a field that that used to be more uh, diary-like. So, look at look at what was original about what they brought to it. Study that carefully. Uh, find writers who resonate with you. Read everything they've written. Read uh, their letters. Read biographies. Then finally, read some critical uh, writings about them. Uh, study poetry. In in. Uh, in an effort to, to gain a sense of how to use uh, imagery in creative ways, how to use language and how to twist language to uh, uh, angles that you don't think of. These things, these things are extremely important. And read the classics and find out what's, what resonates with the classics and why they're state, rather than the flavor of the month, you know, because the classics have resonated with people for, for centuries. There's, there's a reason for that. And try to, try to bring those elements to, to what you're doing. But if you don't know your craft, I mean, if you, if you don't go to the, the bookstore every month, and leaf through the current travel magazines and see who's writing what. Now, some places have been written about to death, and if you're going to write about those places, you've got to say something from a fresh angle. Well, what can you bring to it? Or, or you're just churning out stuff that somebody said a, a thousand times. And if, if you do, they're, they're going to read it and, and just chuck it. Nobody's nobody's interested. So. And if, when you are. Oh yes. Okay. Um, but I think that also is kind of. I think a lot of people think that, oh wow, travel writing is fantastic. You get paid to go to these amazing locations, have these amazing experiences. There's not a better job. And okay, it is true, it is a fantastic job, but I mean, it really, I can't stress this enough, it actually is work. And when you're on assignment, you are taking notes, you're constantly tape recording conversations, you're always trying to think of your angle, how are you gonna tell the story? And I mean, I would be spending the whole day, you know, going out doing the actual trip, and then coming back, you know, to my tents, to my hotel room at night, and just, you know, staying out for hours and hours writing my notes because you want to really make sure that you capture that immediate experience. Like, I really can't stress enough the importance of taking notes, especially at the end of the day. And I mean, you may have just done a 30k hike or something, but you really you want to just get and capture those immediate. Like you, you can take your notes in a bar if you want. I mean, that's perfectly acceptable. That's my method, but yeah. often you can you, you can find a comfortable place, but you do have to do the work. I mean, it's a, it's, everybody gets into this field because they don't want to do a real job. I mean, I hate nine to five, and I, I'm unemployable basically after after so long doing this. But uh, it, there there is work involved, and you have to care about your craft, and you have to study it and learn it. And this this brings up an, another point of, in terms of notes that um, I wanted to mention. They'll often tell you that uh, you should learn how to take photographs if you want to illustrate your articles. I disagree with that as well. I mean, if I haven't already offended everybody yet, I, I think you can do that. Uh, and if you're if you're doing sort of the sort of how-to travel articles, you know, go to Paris, here's a three fun days in Paris or something, you can, you can illustrate your own uh, articles quite well, but I don't think you can master both. 
I, I, I travel with a photographer most of the time. It's it makes your life more difficult. It's easier for the magazine to send you uh, alone if you can do both, but it, it's two different eyes. I mean, I, I travel with a Toronto photographer, Jason George, quite often. He's a brilliant artist, and he's he's, he's looking for uh, colors and uh, shadows of, of contrast, contrasts of light and darkness, uh, interesting faces, and I'm, I'm not seeing that stuff at all. I need to to get into it. It's to the writing mindset. You you've got to sit. Uh, Sit, sit in a cafe somewhere, maybe for half a day, and soak up the place. Yeah. Um, I, you sometimes you have to write your way into it as well. I like start to to notice smells and sounds and and things like this, but capture um, how the place feels. What uh, what sort of memories does it call up? Maybe uh, snatches of conversation that you hear. So you, if you're if you're constantly looking for if you're constantly seeing seeing the world like this and looking for photos, I, I don't think I think you can do both, but I don't think you can do a really good job of both, and I don't think you can master both. Yeah, but that, that's yeah. just my opinion. No, actually, uh, uh, well, on the one hand, I think you are a lot more marketable if you are a photographer and a writer, and magazines will be more inclined to send you somewhere because you know you're going to have a great story, and you can also take your own photographs. It's great, it's cutting down costs. But actually, I do agree with Ryan. I've gone on an assignment where I've also been a photographer, and I've gone with the photographer. And I personally much prefer going with the photographer because, again, you can, you're can you fully focused on getting the story. You're not thinking about angles and lighting and getting so, well, this is me personally, but getting so paranoid that you're not going to get the shot that you completely miss the moments. So. And the other thing is, if you're taking your own photos, you got to get up really early, which is awful. <laughs> I mean, it's it's generally writers the like worst to, picture of travel writers. Generally, writers are. like to stay up late and, and, and have something to drink and, and write your notes. And if, if you have to get up with a butt crack of dawn, it's gone. I, I know, I'm not doing it. But it's it's a good point that Andrew makes. It's you make yourself more marketable. So it's a, it's a it's a compromise: marketability or uh, your dedication to your craft. And I prefer to let I prefer to let my my writing speak for itself. I mean, I, I feel it's good enough that I'll get the call no matter what. And I. So far, it's, it's worked out. So. Yeah, what about you, Laura? Because I know... Anyone have any questions? <laughs> It depends what kind of travel writing you want to do. I mean, if you're just kind of doing uh, a list, a list guide, of, you know, Paris. These are the top ten things you should do. Then, yeah, you don't want that. You won't have first person. But if you want to actually do more of a feature or more of a travel story, then I'd say then definitely write in first person. And you want to make sure that what you submit is not essentially your itinerary, because I think that's kind of a bad tendency in travel writing where it's essentially just a list of things and places and people that the writer has met, which is not a story. So I think it's, it's really, really important to find your angle, to find your story, to find kind of what themes are important, to make sure that you know the local people are getting their voice. It's not just kind of you going there and just, I guess, it doesn't work. I, mean, I, pitch, I come up with uh, something very vague usually. Uh, <laughs> Like last uh, last year, the year before, I did um, I went to Jordan and, and did uh, a camel expedition with the Bedouin tribesmen. We hooked up with some guys in Wadi Rum, and the photographer and I and one Bedouin guy rode off for about a week on camels and slept on the ground and all this. Uh, I didn't know what what the story would be apart from that. So it, a story like that has to be told in the first person. I mean, it's you're you're talking about how you interacted with the desert, and then and when you get home, you'll write out all your notes, write out kind of point form what the major scenes were and what. Uh, the major events of the of the story, were, or your trip, rather, and uh, you'll see the threads of the story in that. And so I usually start by just fleshing out those those main scenes, and then I'm, I'm, the opening comes later. I usually have a good ending though before that uh, before That's that good. happens. You gotta do. That's a, a really good point too. That to come back to what I said earlier about not uh, imposing an agenda on something. Uh, the first assignment I got, I just missed a call to Israel, and the first assignment I got was actually South Dakota. I thought, yeah, okay, sure, whatever, I'll take it. Yeah. And then I, I couldn't sleep for two days. I'm like, mother of God, how am I going to make that sound interesting? You know, I just pictured <laughs> some dude ranches and dull, hey, dull dude flat. ranches are fun. Well, yeah, I was, I was quite surprised, actually, but 
so I, I knew I wanted to go to the Badlands and do, do some hiking and camping. I thought, okay, hopefully, God, I hope something comes out of that. I got a little nervous because you, you have to produce. It's not like when you're just pitching something based on a tribute. Did. So they're sending me down there. We're getting, we're getting all this stuff for free. Uh, it, it turned out to be quite a fascinating place because once you get there, you see that the way that the Badlands erode down into the ground uh, kind of mirror the, the culture of that place. Like there, there are layers of history from old prospectors camps up in the hills to the, to the Native American culture where, where they're, they're carving crazy horse out of a mountain. And uh, the Badlands, how they erode down. So it, it brought in really interesting parallels with time and time and memory and uh, the history of that place. And it turned out to be a really cool feature. So don't discount places that you might think are really dull. And don't don't uh, go in with a preconceived notion because once you get there, you might find that it's really interesting. We got charged by buffalo lots of times and menaced by all kinds of animals. It was pretty cool. <laughs>
Like, I look at the maps and I see the places that they mention and highlight, and look at, look at the map and see all the places they don't highlight. Because everybody's going to those ones that they mention. I want to find places that, that aren't of interest to other people. I don't want to, I don't want to travel and see somebody from, from Canada, you know, or see somebody I know that's awful. I want to, I want to get away from anybody. I mean, I'm a bit of a recluse and, and kind of grouchy, so... So, using a guidebook... I see you I know, that nobody wants to see me as well. <laughs> but using a guidebook in, in reverse like that means you don't end up to places that absolutely everybody's going to and everybody's covering. There's some places that, that do merit that, but... And for the tap water thing, I mean, drink gin or, or beer, you're, you won't get ill. Well, you will get ill, but you won't get parasites. <laughs> Maybe in the ice cubes. No, the, the gin kills anything in the ice cube, I found. That's my math for Sir? Yes. Outside of uh, a few publications, a few slight publications, and how close to one of them, I presume, um, travel writing seems to be very banal. They, they want to have just the basic information. It's not even worthwhile going to any site. You can do that on the internet. And then also on the internet, you can find some phenomenal writing of people doing uh, situations. You're competing against that to a certain extent. You have to write better for the magazine. Right? Mm -hmm. So you agree with that? Yeah. No, yeah. Yeah. no, I think that's actually why. Okay, obviously I'm going to say this because I work for a magazine, but I, the reason that I well, even wanted to work for Epos in the first place was because I felt that it offers travel writing as kind of more of a craft or an art itself. It's not just the banal, this is what we do, this is my itinerary, this is how you go and do things. It's actually about the story, it's about the culture, about the people that you meet, interactions. To me, it's, what, it's more like what travel writing should be. Well, it's very few magazines publish narrative travel pieces. Yeah. I mean, it, that's why I, I, I like working with Outpost because they'll, they'll publish, I can get 12 or 14 pages for a feature, which uh, in the, the big American ones, Nat Geo Traveler, maybe, yeah, or even yeah. Wanderlust, they, they're four or five. Exactly. It's, it's a lot more superficial, so it's pretty hard, short of books, to get into the meat of something unless, unless you can write long narrative features, and, and that's why I'm just no interest in reading any of that stuff. And I think just kind of finding. Yeah, without a doubt, um, for me. I went up to the north and uh, was on the Ganges River where they burned the bodies in, uh, in Varanasi and it was un unbelievable. Um, well, uh, my favorite place recently is uh, Stonehenge. I was in the last year and uh, it, just, I, it was really surreal seeing it in person. And it's just so serious, nobody knows how it got there. And, it's just the, the mystery of it. It's very, very breathtaking, as as you would say. <laughs> I don't know, I'm always the worst person to ask when people always ask me where my favorite place is. I don't know, I always feel that there's bits of every place I've been that I really love. Like, I I lived in New Zealand for a year and I love that, especially around the South Islands. Um, I lived in Japan for a year and I there's parts of Japan I love, like in Gifu. And there's this one uh, village where they have this all-night um, Bonodori Japanese dancing festival and they close it down. It's in this tiny village in the middle of the mountains and there's these thousands of people who are all dressed in like summer kimono and they're just dancing up and down the street all night and it was amazing like i really love doing that kind of cultural activity like some of the festivals there and festivals in other parts of southeast asia are really um, yeah for me i think um, probably mongolia but i like the wide open spaces um, you know, there was there were no roads, so you just kind of cut across country. I had a jeep and a driver. I was on my own. It wasn't a magazine assignment. I traveled with these two Swedish girls, and we uh, we just traveled across the open countryside and camp wherever you want. So the, the people were really tough and kind of kind of windburned from from the, the harsh climates. Uh, and in the Gobi, like we broke down in the middle of the Gobi, the whole transmission fell out of the jeep, and there was uh, no nobody went that way. So we wouldn't see anybody for days. And the guy ended up he ended up fixing with a hatchet, but we're down to our last water and food. And camping out there under the stars, it was unbelievable. I mean, the moon, the stars were out, and it was so bright that like you just lay on the ground and, and watch them layer upon layer. And then uh, later, I went to sleep, and then woke up again. I, I thought the sun had come out, but it was the moon, and you, you could read by it. So, it a, so Mongolia is a place that really, really got me. I like, I like the people, and I like the fact that it's hard to get to. The further you get, the, the less they, they had no idea where you're from. I mean, they asked how much we earned per year in meat, the equivalent of because everything is mutton and, and sheep meat. So. 
and they had the people in the middle of Mongolia had as little regard for the outer world as as the outer world does for them, and I thought that was pretty cool. diversifying my skill set, but I'm full-time at Outpost, and I do sales, and very little writing, <laughs> so that's the way that I'm kind of making it work, and I'm staying in the travel publication, and making it work for me that way. Well, I'm still studying at school, so uh, I, I, was, I, I was at Outpost the summer as an intern, so um, that's what I did there, but now I'm just freelancing a little bit, sort of working for my campus newspaper at, at Centennial, but um, so... You know, I'm, I'm still young, so I, I'm not full-time at this point. Yeah, I'm on the, on the mass side at Outpost, but um, pretty freelance, uh, freelance in terms of, of payments and articles. And I've got uh, another profession as well, and I coach uh, kind of the cutting edge of, it's this thing called RMAX, it's the cutting edge of sports performance enhancement. Like, I travel around coaching pro sports teams, martial arts, people, UFC fighters, uh, government agencies, secret service, and some European countries. So, it's... It also involves a lot of travel, but I'd say I make it's about 50 50 in terms of work and income. And so I know I was going to say that. It's, it's very marketable as well. Like if I can if I can go someplace coaching a seminar or working with some some group internationally, I can I can extend my ticket, stay a little longer, uh, write a story on it, and and actually earn money for my downtime. So that works as well. So in, in addition, you can get assignments or you can you can hook up your own trips. The thing with hooking up your own trips, you you never make enough money from one article to cover a, the cost of a trip. So like the industry is it's, it's a strange industry because they'll tell you many publications will blacklist you for taking press trips. Press trips are um, trips that tourism agencies organize and host you and show you around and, and the idea is that that's it's probably quite biased. If, you, if you're being paid or, or getting all kinds of freebies, then you're likely to be favorable to those people. I don't think it's necessarily true, but uh, so if you do that kind of stuff and, and take a trip, a lot of magazines will be very unhappy with you and won't want to work with you, but at the same time they know that you can't make enough money off one article to cover a trip, so it's quite often uh, they don't want to know and they don't want to ask you, and that's the industry works a lot like that if you're if you're financing full time in travel. Yeah. I mean that's that's how it really works. They won't tell you that, but this. Any other questions? Can I offend anybody Um, at, the, at the back of the, most of the features in Outpost, there's a thing called outposting, and they go through stats. They, that kind of brings out sort of the nuts and bolts stuff, so you don't have to pay so much attention to that, but I, it depends on what your focus is. Like when I wrote about the Bedouin, it's the Bedouin are an important part of, of the culture of Jordan. Like the whole society is founded on nomads. The royal family now is descended from nomads, so there's been sort of two timelines running throughout that culture. Um, linear time, what I call linear time, all the biblical history, the Roman history, the uh, colonization history, and then the Bedouin time, which is circular. You have to bring that's a, that's a time where I would bring in some history and blend that together. But it's it's always pegged on on your experience, the high points of your trip, and uh, you sort of have to find a place where your trip and history intersected. And that was one for me traveling in the desert because it's such a timeless place, and and things don't conform to, to linear time. So you might not always throw that stuff in, but generally it's quite short. I find in these sorts of narratives, they're more personal, subjective. But I mean, you're right. It is. It's I find it quite a challenge to kind of weave in all the history versus personal experience versus, you know, description of the country. And it's um, what technology do you usually have with you? Pencil and notebook. Yeah. <laughs> I would work. 
I always, I really like yeah. to tapeboard. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like I mean, okay. but on the one hand, it can be pretty invasive if you're having this intimate conversation with someone, and then all of a sudden you're like, hold on, let me record that. So it is a little bit stop and start. So I don't record everything, but I actually really find it helpful to record just snippets of conversations, um, and even if it's you know informal, if you're sitting around the campfire or whatever, just because you can. When you listen to it again, you really are back in that moment. It's a new place, and you can hear all the sounds of just being outside that you maybe have forgotten. So I don't know. I find it really helpful to record things. Yeah. So so in some way it would be like a digital voice recorder and um, hopefully a digital SLR camera. That's probably that's all I'd say. Digital rather than print camera for sure. If you take your, your own yeah. photos, I've got a print camera still. <laughs> it's really yeah, it's really convenient. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just, I don't know if I need to clarify anymore. <laughs> but uh, for the kind of places I go to, I'm, I'm kind of afraid to use a so any kind of digital device because I'm gonna make it a spear through the guts for stealing someone's soul. You yes, know what this yes. devil machine is? <laughs> it's, it's, it could be pretty scary. But um, for me, a small notebook. To keep in your pocket, you know, through the day, and a pen that you can scribble notes down in, in the moment when nobody's looking, kind of thing, and catch immediate expressions, short form, and then go back at night and write them in a bigger book that you keep someplace safe, you know, in a ziplock bag so it doesn't get soaked. Yeah, that's a good point. Because it's it's very subjective. Write down a few words. Everybody's got a different a different technique, and there's no kind of one way to do it. But for me, I've got a really good memory for stuff like that, like scenes and, and sense impressions and. And if I just read a couple notes, I'll remember immediately. I mean, 10, 10 50 years back. Well, I'm not 15. 15, 20, 20 is pushing it, maybe. But. So a couple notes does it for me, but if, if you can hear, um, that's why music is good, too. Sometimes I'll pick up music from a country, you know, when I come back, throw it on. And that sort of takes you back, too. But it's it's all a matter of after, when you're writing the story, how, how to drop yourself back into that experience again and, and make it come alive, because you have to sink into that and tell it as if you're still there. So. Yeah, and then I think... Sorry, this is kind of a sort of leading point, but just when you're writing too, um, to make sure that you're kind of engaging all the senses, because that's a huge part of traveling, that it's not just what you see or what you hear, it's also what you smell, what you feel, what you taste. So, I don't know, to me, the you know the best travel writing really engages all your senses. And that's why you should read everything in the genre and, and find out what's good about what other people are doing, because uh, you, even non-travel writing, like uh, D.H. Lawrence is a great example of somebody who does this. If you study, study a writer like that, you'll you'll get a keen sense of, of an original way to approach that sort of thing and you can start bringing it to your own work. What travel writers do you admire? Well, you like Durrell and... I like Lars Durrell and uh, yeah. Paul Theroux. Uh, Chaplin sometimes. I absolutely cherry Durrell. Do you ever read uh, The Worst Journey in the World? That's, that's one of the best travel books I've ever read about a, the Scott expedition to Antarctica. This was the guy who, who went on this trip. It's, it's really gripping. It's a great read. But yeah, people like that, I would say. Oh, I'm about to conflict what you said, yeah, but I don't actually uh, read a lot of travel literature, but I, <laughs> oh, I know, it's terrible. 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 But I read a lot of stories uh, by authors about um, their experience elsewhere, like I read a lot like uh, Jan Wong and about her, her trip to China and things like that, but they're, I don't think they can be classified as travel literature, but is that an answer? <laughs> well, it's, it's kind of a fine line as well, because... Um, the cool thing about travel writing is it can be so many things, and it can be memoir, uh, history, architecture. It can be writing about food. Uh, it could it could be sort of strict travel, but it it lends so many genres that you can take so many different angles and approaches. That's kind of why I enjoy it. So the kind of writers that you read might might be determined by that. I mean, I think the Odyssey is the greatest travel book ever told. So. <laughs> that's a good point. Well, that's another good point as well. That I, it, it pisses me off when people don't read about a place before they go there and do some homework. I mean, you want you want fresh impressions that nobody else has written about, but also you don't want to say the trite, obvious things that everybody said. But if you go to a place, you've you, these people are taking the time to talk to you, and you, you don't know a thing about their history, you, you know nothing about their culture. You're insulting them by by doing dumb things. And it's that's really unforgivable. I mean, you're you're a guest in that country, and you should. You should at least have done your homework. I mean, I read five, six, eight books maybe before a trip, and then many more after to kind of get oriented. Something history. Um, my my academic background is anthropology, so something from that that angle maybe. Uh, uh, fiction and poetry from a country maybe to, to get a sense of how people see the world in that place. So 
I, if you don't do your homework, you're selling the reader short, then you're selling yourself short, I think. Yeah. Actually, that's a good point. I, really, I like writing, reading uh, like ethnographies and anthropology. And, yeah, I think it's always... Mm. One of the best sources of that, too, is um, old explorer's journals. That's pretty yeah. cool. Like, uh, Richard Burton is a great hero of mine. The, uh, the explorer Richard Burton, not the actor. And he's... Uh, He's got a, a tremendous amount of, uh, of these old journals, and you can you can dig back into that stuff and see what it looked like, you know, 200 years ago. But he's got minute observations about uh, plants and cultural things, stuff that don't exist anymore. But it's interesting to see those those parallels today when you go to a place. So sometimes I'll read something very old like that, and I'll see what it was like at first contact compared to now, which cultural threats survive, and things of that nature. Not quite. I think we got time for one more question. If anybody's got one more question. In the very, very back. Wait, was that a question? No waiver? <laughs> Just saying hello? Well, hello to you. Over here. All right. A suitable ending, I think. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, please give a round of applause to Sarah, Laura, Andrea, and Ryan from Outpost Magazine. And uh, we're going to have a quick turnover here because uh, we, we like to run things. We could have been talking about that until 7 o'clock tonight.